And welcome back to Think Tech. This is Transitional Justice, where we talk to people all around the world and find out what's doing in transitional justice, which means the investigation of atrocities, violations of human rights, war crimes, and all that. And one of our earlier guests is going to appear again with us today. Um, she's Cynthia Ibali, and, and she is in Uganda right now. And we're going to talk about um, Darfur and Khartoum and Sudan in general and all those warring factions that we see and can't understand very well. Cynthia, welcome back to the show. It's so nice to see you. I, I'm i sorry about all the trouble. You know, when we spoke last, uh, it seemed to be a light at the end of the tunnel for Sudan. And uh, maybe there was going to be some rational result, but that hasn't happened. That was, what, six or seven weeks ago. And gee whiz, it's, it's just gotten worse ever since. Can you give us a status report? Thanks for having me, Jay. And yes, um, a few weeks ago when we spoke, I did, we did, a number of people, well, did think that there would be an end to this crisis, or at least some kind of meeting um, of minds that would agree for the better of the country. Unfortunately, we are seven weeks into the conflict and um, there is mass devastation across uh, in Khartoum and Darfur, and also parts of um, North Kordofan in Elobeit. So, um, and this, if I could just also <laughs> go back to the beginning, the fight is between um, the Rapid Support Forces, who are the RSF in short, were headed by General uh, Muhammad Dagalo, also known as Hemeti. And the Sudan Armed Forces uh, were headed by General Al Burhan. Yeah, you'd think they would get together for the benefit of the country, the people of the country, but they keep on fighting. Um, you know, if you and I could get in a room with them, I'm sure we could explain to them just how destructive it is to keep on fighting and make the civilians in the middle the targets of all this. Um, so it really hasn't changed in six or seven weeks, and they've been fighting all this time. And I suppose I should ask you about the change in terms of, you know, other countries, other powers, if you will, um, that are trying to bring this to an end. I mean, the fighting to an end, um, including the, the U.S. and all the efforts to take care of refugees, have people um, escape, uh, leave the country. Um, that has to be going on too, I, I hope. Yes, so there have been efforts, uh, diplomatic efforts by uh, various um, parties, sorry, foreign governments to try and, you know, resolve the conflict in Sudan, the current conflict. Like you already mentioned, the US and Saudi Arabia had engaged in talks with both sides. That's most recently, the most recent recent uh, engagements with the armed parties. But unfortunately, last Wednesday, this is 31st March, uh, talks were suspended after the uh, Sudan armed forces pulled out, uh, claiming that the uh, reports indicate that they claim the RSF has been um, uh, not adhering to the ceasefires, which is, I mean, both 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 sides have not been adhering to any ceasefire agreements um, or even um, um, honored their commitments for humanitarian access or humanitarian corridors to allow access to those in need. Um, the situation with the, in terms of refugees um, or at least people fleeing, um, seeking refuge for, to other parts uh, sorry, to neighboring countries is also a bit, um, has been a bit tricky. <laughs> is that the word? But not the best response. So you have, at the start of the conflict, a number of people, actually majority, I think about over 300,000, uh, fled to Egypt. And you had long queues at the border and, you know, a new border certain restrictions that processes that would ordinarily take maybe a day or two are now taking uh, weeks, a week or, or more. And this is a journey um, that also takes another week to get to Cairo or the other destinations that people are seeking. Um, there was also um, cause for concern because this border 
border areas do not have the facilities to handle the um, influx of people that are coming in. Then at the uh, also at the start, you had you know people from the four. The nearest would be Chad, um, and so a number of people were fleeing and had already fled. Uh, even before the conflict, because you remember the four has been a uh, uh, conflict-affected zone for quite some time. So at the start, we had reports that Chad had, you know, closed its borders. But uh, despite that, uh, people have managed to gain access using, so they're walking all the way from El Janina, taking the journey across to Chad because, you know, the border with Chad, because of the insecurity in uh, the four. Then you have people coming into South Sudan. And South Sudan, you have people coming in from Darfur, but also from Khartoum. Um, South Sudan is receiving uh, people who have fled from South Sudan to Sudan for refuge and now forced to go back to a country that they had fled. Oh, uh, that must be really hard on them. Yes, it, it, it definitely is. Um, so, yeah, and then also you also have... Um, Sudanese and other nationalities were trying to get out uh, of um, to safer areas. Um, the journeys have been long. Um, there have been reports of a number of checkpoints that people have had to go through as they're making these journeys. Uh, and of course, uh, such as during at these checkpoints, the insecurity also to make this journey. Um, the uh, amount of money, because with the demand, of course, people have capitalized on that and prices have gone up for transportation and the like. Uh, so, yeah, in a nutshell, that's pretty much. Mm. Now, let me ask you some questions about it. See, that, that border thing with Egypt really sounds uh, disturbing. It, it sounds like the U.S. border with Mexico, where you get stopped and um, and and there's opportunity to take advantage of your you know, and uh, and the, the people who provide the transportation probably do that by asking you for money that is way too way too much for the transportation. Um, and then, of course, what you exactly in a refugee situation? What do you want to have all these checkpoints for? What's the purpose of that? Um, what are they concerned about? What justification can they provide um, for having all these checkpoints? Who's operating it? Tell me more about the checkpoints. So the checkpoints I have heard about from, you know, colleagues I've spoken to, especially people who are fleeing, the force seem to be manned by RSF. And what they're asking you is where you're going, your whereabouts, who, you know, trying to figure out who you are, if you're part of, you know, engaging activities, if you're added. Um, yeah, if you're engaged in activities, if you're one of the, which side are you on type of situation. Uh, numerous questions answered, sorry, asked um, about, you know, why you're making this trip. Uh, so, yeah, and then also there's been, um, yeah, so pretty much. What about think, the border, uh, border with Egypt? I mean, Egypt was um, there uh, at the beginning. You and I talked about Egypt's presence at the beginning of this. Uh, but it apparently left. It left uh, Sudan, went, and it, it had troops there in Sudan. And it left. What's the What's the status of Egypt's involvement now? Um, so far now, the status of the involvement has been with the uh, re receiving of refugees uh, or people fleeing. Um, I don't. I don't know if refugees at the right time, but at least people fleeing. Uh, the conflict in Sudan seeking refuge. So yeah, I guess we can say refugees. Um, Is Egypt but, offering them refuge? Uh, it's been a bit tricky. So to say yes, some people have, no, a, majority, a good number have gotten through the border, but a good number are still stuck or mm -hmm. trying to get through. Um, through to, and I think also, probably people would justify that, you know, they're also looking out for their resources to um, to support the people who are seeking refuge. So that could also be another issue, is uh, a number of times not, uh, these countries are also, you know, 
Um, opening doors means, you know, you're stretching the resources you have. And so, but still. And which which I, side is Egypt on? Was Egypt, is Egypt on the uh, Sudanese army side or the RS, RSF? So Egypt was uh, or is um, aligned with the Sudan Armed Forces. I haven't seen or had reports of where whether they are taking sides, but they are known to be um, a back of the Sudan Armed Forces. I think at the beginning when we spoke about um, Egypt's involvement, they were helping with evacuation with some some evacuations at, at that time. Uh, whether they've been actively engaged in a conflict, I can't. I know I can't. Um, mm. I can't say for sure that they have, uh, but they are known to be um, allies, or at least have backing, have backed the Sudan armed forces in the past. Well, that 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 makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's it's the legitimate. I mean, if you if you if you care to cast it that way, the legitimate government of Sudan is the army. That's what it is. Well, what about what, go ahead so that's uh actually an interesting comment because there's also been um a bit of uh not a bit but um yeah there's been conversations about uh people taking sides in this conflict and so because it's a campaign and not to war not to war campaign that um you know, the civil society resistance committees have backed not to support anyone in this conflict because it's all it's doing is causing mass destruction. Um, and so to say whether who or who is like both sides are, you know, um, whatever you engaged in is wrong. But of course, there's been, um, what can I call it? Uh, backers of especially Sudan armed forces or the what they call the Islamist movement, uh, calling those who haven't, you know, taken sides that, you know, you're uh, probably a traitor or, you know, how do you not back the Sudan armed forces because they are the establishment, you know, the state uh, military force. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's, I see why you say it's an interesting comment. <laughs> But you know, it's an interesting conversation. So they ask you, um, whose side are you on? And you say, I'm not, I'm not on anyone's side. I just want to, this, this, this okay. killing to stop. And then they say, oh, well, th that means you're a traitor. But wait a minute. I told you that I'm on no one's side. Uh, of course, then you could say, well, okay, I'm on, I'm on your side. Um, no, actually, the side of the civilians. Uh, the people get... They, it's, so, it's, there's three parties in the game, uh, yeah. you know. There's, there's a, the army, there's the RSF, and there's the civilian. And the army and the RSF have all the weapons. Mm. <laughs> They're shooting the civilians. It's madness. It's madness. Yeah, yeah. It is. So, um, how about Ethiopia? Is Ethiopia involved at all in trying to help people? Oh yes. So. Uh... There have been, uh, sorry, I hadn't spoken about that, uh, people crossing over to Ethiopia. So that's towards the east of Sudan and onto Ethiopia at the borders. Again, there's been, um, there's not as many reports, but um, there's been, there's been um, issues with uh, receiving of you know, uh, people seeking refuge. Uh, from Ethiopia, but some, but yes, the, um, these are restrictions of border entry restrictions have been imposed, but people have been able to go through. Uh, it hasn't been as smooth, I must say. Um, I, I probably think maybe the smoothest entry, but that's also has been quite long, has been maybe people who have gone into South Sudan. Um, but uh, again, it hasn't been as smooth because there, are, I mean, other um, barriers that have, you know, hindered people trying to flee into safety. What about uh, Uganda? It's not that far. It's not contiguous, but it's not that far. Are people trying to get into uh, Uganda and uh, seek refuge there? 
Yes, uh, so Uganda has received uh, a number of uh, people who have sought to seek refuge here. Um, people fleeing the conflict from Sudan, but they have usually transited to another country. So probably you're coming either from Cairo or um, you made it to Addis uh, for, or uh, you're going through um, South Sudan and have continued down into Uganda. Um, yeah, so we have an open policy. So it's been, I haven't had um, issues about entry into Uganda. Um, I, I do know so Kenya has received uh, some people fleeing there, so I, I haven't had any issues. But of course, uh, you know, the entry restrictions. So to enter Uganda, you need uh, you need a visa. Uh, so yeah, mm. you know, it sounds to me like um, first the economy and the social society of Sudan is is in, is a train wreck right now. They, how yeah. can you have an economy with this? And everybody's afraid for his life or her life. And and then you have uh, refugees trying to get across uh, into other countries. And so this is um, not only destabilizing, tell me if I'm right, uh, not only destabilizing in Sudan, it's destabilizing in the surrounding countries because refugees put pressure on the country, yeah. um, both in terms of um, you know the, the geopolitics, but also in terms of the resources, as you said, in the case of Egypt. Um, so this is not good for, for um, sub-Saharan Africa. It's not good. Or I guess this is North Saharan. This is Eastern Africa is what it is. Yeah. It's, 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 not, it's not good for any of those countries. It's destabilizing, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, so, of course, uh, no one also that there would be an influx of people coming in. So that means, you know, resources are spread out thin. I mean, even for the people, something we have also not spoken about is that, you know, not everyone is able to leave. So people have been displaced in other parts of Sudan. So within Sudan, so we have internally displaced people from Khartoum fleeing to um, states that are bordering or at least... Uh, yeah, bordering Khartoum. And even with that, um, so now, like, let's say recently in Elobaid, uh, this is also an area that has experienced conflict, is those have been raided. Uh, I think World Food Program um, mentioned that this stores was, was raided, uh, or looted, rather, just uh, last week. Um, MSF has also uh, had reports of... Um, so it has reported uh, looting of their, their stores, but then also within Khartoum, our factories um, have been looted, you know, uh, what are they called, silos, holding grain have also been looted. Um, there's been also a bit of a, not a bit, a collapse in the banking system with, first of all, uh, you know, the fighting, the bombings and all have destroyed some of the infrastructure. So let's say like um, uh, electricity or mobile networks, which are needed to run uh, certain systems, but then also banks have been looted. Uh, businesses have also not, uh, have not been spared. And so, you know, there's also looting there. So that has just also increased, um, you know. So it's hard to get food then. Well, yeah, um, there's access to food has definitely been hindered. And then also with, uh, you know, a lack of humanitarian corridors, you know, you can't get food into where people are needed the most. Um, and the airport in Khartoum is still not functioning? Oh, no, no, that's not functioning. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, you know, what's really remarkable is that these two guys keep on beating each other up at the expense of the country. Um, is there anybody sending aid or, or for that matter, um, uh, soldiers or material to either side? Are they, are they just all um, limited to their own indigenous armies? 
So aid or humanitarian response has been taken on by civil society actors on the ground. Uh, the resistance committees have led um, a response to uh, to devastation that has occurred. Uh, so they've created what they call, especially in Khartoum, they've created what they call emergency response rooms. And so within this emergency response, uh, people are able to you know, um, seek information about, you know, medical services. And these are very uh, neighborhood focused. So that's how, you know, on the ground and closer to the people they are. Uh, but then there's also been, because um, Sudan is quite communal, they look out for each other. And so even with the people who have been displaced, uh, people have made makeshift uh, shelter or have at least opened their homes. Um, I remember the steps, uh, the first weeks of the conflict, there were pictures as people were fleeing um, on the highway, people were coming out to give them food, to give them water, to wish them well on their journey. And so, uh, but yeah, um, a few weeks back, you know, there was a receipt of um, aid for, I think it was the World Food Program and uh, also, WHO, the World Health Organization, had received some supplies through uh, the Red Sea state, so through Port Sudan, and uh, they're trying to now, you know, um, take it out into, uh, you know, inner parts of the country. Destination was Khartoum at one point. But again, with these roadblocks and stuff, it's been a it's been a bit difficult. Oh my so, goodness! Yes. So when you have two armies fighting with each other like this, um, you need money. You need money yeah. for weapons and uh, ammunition. You need money to pay the troops. They don't, and you need to, to buy them food and supplies and what have you. Where is that coming from? Uh, do, do both of these armies have resources that would allow them to? you know, continue this fight or are they going to run out of money uh, and ammunition? Or is there somebody outside supplying them with this to sort of encourage them to continue the fight? I mean, they do have their companies where they have, um, they have economically benefited and that has also um, provided the resources they need uh, for the weapons and so, so even before the fighting, they did have their own companies. And interesting that she say that because um, during the conflict, I think a week or two weeks ago, uh, but uh, Burhan, uh, General Burhan, who is a de facto head of state, being the de facto, because he's the head of the army at the time, um, sorry, is the head of the army actually now, um, issued a decree where they froze um, Salaries going to the RSF, who are now what they consider the terrorist group, their enemy. And so this is what apparently triggered um, the looting of banks because they were oh. this to their salaries. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, they do also have um, companies that do, if I'm correctly they also make their own weapons and interesting that you say that because just last week uh i am sure you heard that the u.s issued sanctions on two uh, so that yeah uh two um companies owned by the rsf and also two companies owned by um uh the sudan armed forces uh in a way to also curb you know uh financial flows that would continue to fuel, you know, the conflict. Are they, are they uh, uh, of equal size and strength and arms, these two armies, or, um, uh, or are they changing? Is, is one side gathering more money and troops and, you know, um, weapons uh, than the other? Um, I don't think they're of equal size and strength. They have their... I mean, they have their strength. I think um, for now, what we're seeing is that uh, the Sudan armed forces seem to have the, you know, um, 
the machinery to do um, airstrikes and air bombardment and stuff like that. But the RSF also have, you know, um, support, especially have seemed to gain more ground on, sorry, yeah, when it comes to fighting on the ground. Mm. Um, and so uh, are able to infiltrate, uh, is that the word? To, um, yeah, through neighborhoods, because that's that has been their tactic. That's the hardest, that's the In worst of all, because that, it's face to face with civilians, you know. Yeah. What, what about, um, what about um, the United Nations? What about um, the United States? Uh, we talk about sanctions uh, recently, but uh, um, are, they, are they doing anything? Are they trying to force these two guys together to make peace? Uh, uh, well, you know, this it all seems like it could go on forever. Um, and the question is, what, what are the powers that be doing to try to bring peace to the region? Yeah, uh, so there have been a number of briefings at, at the uh, Security uh, Council level, but we haven't seen much movement, I must say. I mean, there have been statements issued asking for both parties to cease fighting. Uh, other than that, uh, the negotiations that have really taken place have been the US-Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia led talks in Jeddah, um, but like I mentioned just last week, um, they were suspended. Their calls to try and have them back on the table. Um, the African Union has also had its own mechanism, um, established an expanded mechanism that's aimed to address uh, the conflict in Sudan. Um, so we're waiting to see how <laughs> that plays into you know negotiating. Um, a ceasefire. And the uh, United Nations, <clears throat> have they taken new steps? Uh, I think they're waiting for, uh, I think they were waiting on the US uh, Saudi led talks. There hasn't been much. It sounds perfectly dreadful, Cynthia. Um, <clears throat> take, take, um, take a guess and tell me. How you think this is going to evolve and how long it'll take to get there? The way things are looking, whoop, one can tell, but it looks like the fighting is still going on for some time, unfortunately. Uh, but we do hope, we do really hope that, you know, we can reach a ceasefire, an actual ceasefire. Uh, to stop this, the destruction. Just, yeah. Um, but why is it that they enter into these agreements for ceasefire and it breaks down almost immediately? How does that work? Well, I like to think it's also because, you know, there are no serious consequences if it breaks down. So it's that, yeah, yeah, we'll agree to it, but, you know, continue our status quo. As things I mean, there's, there hasn't been enough incentive to make them want to stop, if I could say that, yeah. Let me offer a thought to you and I'll see what you think. <clears throat> it's like um, my theory of the stock market. The stock, the stock market goes up and, until people get tired of seeing it go up, then it goes down. And it goes down until people get tired of it going down, and then it goes up. And so uh, I think after a while, history moves through this and mm -hmm. people, both armies, both generals will get tired and it'll stop because they're tired of doing that. You can't do that your whole life, I hope. Um, do, do you think they're getting tired now? I do hope they get tired soon because we need an end sooner rather than later, for sure. Yeah, I do hope they get tired soon. Now, the way things doesn't look like it, but I really do hope we get to that point where it's like, okay. Um, yes. A project expedite justice is always interested in violations of human rights, atrocities, war crimes, and all that. And I would, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe there's not enough information out from what is happening on the ground, but I would, I would imagine that there's plenty of atrocities going on. 
uh, plenty of war crime. When you when you have armed, not only one but two armed camps, um, killing civilians, bombing. You know, it's the same thing as Ukraine, isn't it? Bombing a, a apartment buildings in which only civilians live, bombing hospitals and schools in which only civilians are present. That's that's an attack on a civilian community, and that's what's happening here. Um, so isn't that isn't that arguably a war crime? I mean, there are acts that definitely have occurred that could that could amount to a war, to war crimes or crimes against humanity as well. Um, say, like you just mentioned, killing of civilians, innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. Um, the you know, due to the indiscriminate, you know, shootings or bombings, uh, trying to you know sniff out the the enemy um, of the other. Um, there's been also, I mean, like we mentioned, looting, um, property destruction. There's been um, reports of massive of sexual sexual abuse. So there's been reports of rape and. Yes. Um, and uh, torture. Yes, yes, uh, detention and torture of um, people who are suspected to be, you know, allied with the other side, and, and a number of these are people who are just, you know, engaged in providing humanitarian assistance, something that these two warring parties are blocking. So it's, yeah. Uh, I mean, also, oh, the do you think there'll be accountability here? I mean, for example, in Ukraine, there are virtually thousands of investigators investigating uh, war crimes and the like, thousands of them. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are documented already. Um, but I'm not sure that's happening in uh, Sudan. Are there people investigating war crimes there? Will there be accountability? Or is the evidence uh, sort of uh, slipping into history? That's a good question. So people are documenting, um, you know, based on the resources they have. Um, so there's been lots of uh, reports or at least shared on social media. Um, of course, with the insecurity, documentation can be, has been a bit tricky. Uh, going to, you know, uh, sites. But there's, there's documentation going on. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned accountability. I mean, right before the conflict, people, you know, there was a push for accountability for mass atrocities that occurred during the previous regime. Even after I remember that. Yes. So this is this is a, a second level, a second layer. You're just adding to the list of atrocities that need to be accounted for. Just you know, adding to a long list of atrocities. so. Again, um, I believe that the push for accountability is still there. Um, when we'll see it, yeah, time will tell, I think. The history of humanity is told by the survivors. And um, those who um, don't survive, or they don't make good witnesses. Sorry. Yeah. So how do you feel about this? I, I mean, you've been covering it. You've been close to it. You've Talk to the people coming coming out of Sudan. You've been following all these mad events, um, and I wonder. You know, you seem overcome to some extent, Cynthia. Uh, since the last time we met, it, it seems to have gotten to you. Am I right? It definitely has. I mean, when you're talking to people and they're, you know, um, in a situation of distress. Um, it's been tough. It's been tough for sure. Um, but we push on. Um, I'm, it's been heartbreaking to see, you know, what's happening in Sudan. I mean, at 20, during 2019, I remember um, I was excited with uh, the majority who saw, you know, hope for a new Sudan. And so that seems to... That seems like a distant past, but uh, I don't think we should give up that easy, though. So, um, I mean, you get on, you see these reports of these atrocities being committed, that gets to you. It's only, you know, 
um, I'm only human, so it does definitely get to me. But you have to try and find a way to keep pushing, uh, to keep supporting the people who need it, um, and to keep, you know, adding to the voice um, and advocating for along with them. So yeah. Well, you got to keep on reporting what you see, what you feel, what's happening, and we'll have to come back to you again. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next time, although I. I hope it's better news then. And, uh, let me say this too, Cynthia. You're you're doing our work. You're you're doing the work that the world needs you to do. So, uh, as they say, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you too, Cynthia Ibali, Project Expedite Justice in Kampala, Uganda. Thank you.